No, it's fine. We can move on because I want to talk about Iran actually. Um, because looking at your the thingy on the list, I'm just like reading the whole um, news article you linked in there, and it's just fucking insane. Oh man. Uh, I, I I know crazy. you're saying it's insane because the way the dude died. I know I know it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. It is a hundred percent that. Because you're Call of Duty player. Dude, I, 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 <laughs> I was sitting there and I'm just like, this world is <laughs> insane. And anyone who says, we, we, we have Second Amendment rights, so that way we can stand up against the government, would get droned immediately. Sean, like which, this. Button, on this your, your arguments Sean, which button on this controller was used to kill the Iranian <laughs> nuclear scientist? <laughs> Do you think it was um, one of the triggers? I like, think I'm pretty th- sure they held, they held left T, used the analog stick, and then hit right, right T 13 times. <laughs> and like, the face recognition like, scanned his face and not his wife's, so you know. No, no, I'm pretty sure at that point, like a Ra- Israeli, Israeli like defense military, you have to be like one of those like 360 no scope players. So, like you have a twitch finger right here, oh, yeah. and you map the trigger button to like the the um the button within the stick. Oh, no. That's some real like gamer move shit right there. Um, what, I, I don't mean to be like racist to Israelis in any way. I hope that's not misconstrued. With that I just mean they're really good at killing um people outside of combat, including children. We're finished. Too. Nice show. hello humans and welcome to mochi industries this is episode 17 of power report i am dan i am here with you how are y'all doing this is the time you're all alive i'm joined by my audio face co-host sean who's right here what's up what's up we're also joined by the we made it podcast fellas caesar Hey. <laughs> and of course, bam. How's everybody doing? This is the Power Report Power Panel. Um, and I am yeah, very excited to get the gang back together uh for a rundown of what is going on in the world, what is going on in America, and um what is going on in my cat who is behind me in her in her uh head because uh she is so lucky that none of this is happening. Anyways, up on the show we have a lot of interesting things. We're going to talk about this um, massive uprising, the biggest uprising, like worker uprising, probably in world mm-hmm. history. Um, it's interesting that no one's talking about it. Um, we're going to talk about the like attempted slow coup of Iran that, um, again, no one seems to be talking about it. And the people who are talking about it are reporting on it as though it's not happening. Um, and then, of course, we're going to start with a little bit of domestic news. Um, we've got some vaccine stuff kind of happening in the midst. We've got... Uh, Georgia runoff election that this will um, be an episode that we're doing before. Um, it's happening really early on in January and I don't know if I'm going to pull you all from your um, state mandated winter vacations or anything like that to do that episode, but um, we'll definitely talk about it after. And I kind of wanted to start it a little bit. Uh, Sean, our epic stats man over here, has got some numbers about... Uh, COVID-19 and what is currently happening. So we are recording this podcast uh, Saturday, December 12th, right? And what are the numbers in the United States currently? Um, So there are 16 million cases of COVID-19 and 296,000 deaths. 296. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Sean, Sean said that like it's just like not a big deal in 296,000, yeah. Because yeah, he knows they're not real stats. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there, there's so much to even go in there. Uh, okay, I can break but... it down state by state and all well, that like, stuff too. Well, okay, so, so, so tell, yeah, yeah. Well, let's do a little bit of that, honestly. So what's going on? Um, this is really fun. This is like a lot of power I have now. What's going on? How many cases are there you said there were? To, uh, 16 million. Right, 16 million all going on in the United States right now. Um, yes. What is going on in like New York, California, the coastal areas, you know, real America? So New York has 760,000 cases um, and uh, 34,983 deaths. Because they got hit hard the, the first wave of COVID. So this, it makes sense why they have the highest number of any state, it looks like, for deaths. California has 1.5 a uh, million cases and 20,854 deaths. Flexing. And Doing Texas, flexing. The Texas following up real fat, real closely with uh, 1.46 million cases and 24,208 deaths. Well, what, there was a big stuff going on in South Dakota. And the Dakotas? Uh, like South, South Dakota in particular, I remember like 
seeing a lot about the rates and like one in eight people or like South Dakota has 89,000 um, cases and uh, 1,200 deaths. Yeah, I think there, there was like something where it's like... A, well, they didn't have COVID for a long time there. Um, and then it exploded, erupted um, not yeah. so long ago. Basically, that's yeah. what happened out there. It's been, a, it it's been a really interesting case because the um, Republican governor there has been um, making a thing like, oh, it's perfect time, it's duck hunting season. I'm doing everything I want to do outside because it's South Dakota and we have freedom here. And the freedom is to die because South Dakota has fewer hospitals than like the Los Angeles metropolitan area. And they like obviously can't handle the existing issues that are going on pre-COVID, let alone with this pandemic really hitting the state. So it's tragic for the people who are um, having to experience that for sure. But this is, I think a lot is going on right now of like who to blame. And uh, definitely every politician who has the ability to do something about this but doesn't is to blame 100%. But at a certain point, we do have two parties. These are the parties in power and we have to like make decisions and like take notes about these things. And like the Republicans by politicizing basic pandemic public health response, by politicizing that early on from the jump out of the gate to make their bet with Trump that they very clearly lost now, they have now created this like paranoia, this added paranoia and this like new second truth throughout the country where Donald Trump has won the election even though like Supreme Court has now decided they're not going to take up these ridiculous cases and like you have this new second wave of thinking that is getting people to not even believe in basic pandemic response and it's because of Republican Party like political strategy and so it has to be said that like yeah Nancy Pelosi is going like okay after the election um, I'm going to now offer, or I'm going to put up less stimulus money on the table right now, even though I wanted more beforehand with Trump, because mm -hmm. now we, we're in power, and so that's better for some reason, so we need less money for some reason, even though this problem's gotten worse. That's a big issue, and not only is it a big issue, it's like one of the reasons I'm really angry about Democrats was in the last episode, will continue to be. But that's a separate thing from what the Republican Party is doing here, and like I'm happy to get into the both parties suck stuff a lot, but like we need to start to get into the why aspect of that. And here's a pretty good reason why, because 300,000 dead is, I don't want to take up too much time, but like that's, that's crazy right now. I mean, I, that's... who's that? So, okay. Um, yeah, it really is uh, from jump. My, so much of my anger has been towards Donald Trump and like all of his sycophants, you know, acting like the pandemic wasn't real. I'm still not over him saying it was a democratic hoax. I'm still not over that. It's almost a year. <laughs> and it, it seemed like we happened to have one of the few countries in the world where the leadership just didn't take it serious and got so many people to not take it serious and to politicize wearing masks. And it's just like the most disgusting thing that could ever happen with something like this. Like people are literally dying, suffering, all kinds of things. And you have people that still to this day, to this day will pretend like it's not real. And I feel like that all comes from Donald Trump. If Donald Trump from jump was just like, yeah, if he just said publicly what he said privately yeah. to that, to that uh, author, I forgot his name now. If he just said publicly what he said privately, we would have a totally different situation right now. And it's really just the most shameful thing about his presidency. Um, the amount of people that have died from COVID has surpassed the amount of soldiers that were killed in the Second World War. Mm. And, and we had the, we had, was, it, was it Thursday we beat the number of people that died during 9-11? Yeah, that's daily cases. It was like 3,100 yeah. people died. In one day. Yeah, and it's... Uh, I think Bam was 100% right because when you have a president that doesn't prioritize the importance of this virus and the, the seriousness of it, then across your entire party and cabinet, they're going to feel – there's a number of reasons why Mitch McConnell has been like the wackest human ever, second to Trump during this entire process. You know, um, just from knowing uh, – just from knowing this personally, you know, the, the pandemic relief the, – anybody that received pandemic relief on March 15th was dated to either the end of the year or until their funds were exhausted. 
And then after their funds were exhausted, they were given an extension. But even if they got an extension, it only went to the end of the year. Everything was dated to the end of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, it's December 12th. If you signed up for pandemic relief, you're only dated to the end of the year. You get two weeks of relief. They're talking about they're going to adjourn next week. Next week, it's like, dog, There's a you're going to leave people waiting to find out their future. Maybe seven, six days it'll pass before a decision's made, before their, their extent, the things are exhausted. And it might not even pass because he just wants to give protections to the corporations that was given people uh, that were given that were given not that they people want to sue and, and, and that were working during the pandemic that were exposed to the virus. And they want to give protections to these corporations like Amazon, like Walmart that stayed open during stay at home orders that people had to work midnight shifts when you're supposed to go home 10 p.m. People got sick. We hit 3000 in one day and these stats that Sean Jamie dropped up, dropped up. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 ridiculous. It's. Now that like Trump is gone, my attention went from hating him to like hating like anybody that's like still rocking with the ideologies that he was dropping during his time period and just trying to like get rid of these people that are like have made this country so garbage. And Mitch McConnell was Mitch McConnell's one of those people, unfortunately. When even Boris Johnson in the UK is like, I got the virus, it's shit, we need to do stuff, even though he's doing like fucking up the north of England anyways. But when he's having a better response than Trump, you know the world is fucked. A, a response is better than no response, and also a response where you're doubting the the most disgusting response is doubting the realness of it. When Sean, you dropped about the World War stats about how many people have died, nine eleven stats. Insane. Um, to to Bam talking about the hoax that we've talked about on the show many times. That's the big issue. People have literally died. It's not like people were just getting the flu and then like going home and it's whatever. No, nah, man, there's bodies that have literally left this planet. If you believe in that. And it's not cool. Like it's really not it's 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 really not cool because this is supposed to be the party that is like the most pro USA flag bearers of all time and go hard. And you're killing off your own people. Not 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 going to the Middle East and doing your thing. No, you're literally killing off your own people and it's not even that important because like Trump said, well the red states <laughs> right. The, the best thing is like Herman Herman Cade died of COVID and they're using oh, the his best Twitter thing, account, hey, Sean. but they're using his Twitter account to promote a bunch of uh, uh, conspiracy theories of COVID. Like Someone the dude died from the best the, thing is Herman Cain and, died. But like, <laughs> and, the dude died of COVID and they're still and, posting all this stuff about like, it's a hoax and all this other uh, Trump talking points. I'm like, are you, Sean's wow. Point, like okay. they didn't skip a beat in doing that. Like Herman Cain died no. fucking like in the summer. And like a month later, someone pointed out like, whoa, like look at his account. It's like tweeting all this like COVID is a hoax stuff. Like the don't worry about wearing your mask, that's freedom stuff. And then like, that was barely registered because like we are all and numb beyond dead. numb beyond numb. I want to get to that numbness point in a second, but bam, yeah, like want to get your thoughts. In. Yeah, like even even like we're talking about the COVID deaths, like I think we also got to talk about people getting sick from it too because that's such a big deal. Like mm-hmm. so many people that I mean I knew I know a lot of people that have didn't really know if they got it or not because they got really sick in like January, February, or December. So this was before people were really talking about COVID, COVID being here. Um, but just reading accounts of people who've gotten the disease, like or gotten the virus, it's it's. You know, it's it's a it's a hard thing to go through. Like people are really getting sick bad. Nobody likes getting flu symptoms. Like you feel like you're gonna die. It's like the worst thing in the world. You have to be uh, quarantined from people for two weeks or or less. You got to get some invasive tests. Mm-hmm. Like all of that stuff is important. Like even like obviously like somebody dying is like way worse. But like just like these people getting sick, like losing your sense of taste. Um, even I know people that have gotten it and you know, it's like a month later and they still have brain fog. They still have like chronic fatigue, all these things. Like we don't know what's going to be the long-term effects of this virus. And if, if, if we, if literally, if we just had a president who said, Oh shit, I don't want the people in this country to be getting this. It would have just been totally different. You look at other countries around the world, like, they, yeah, yeah. they, 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 like even the countries that got it bad, like Spain and for, for, like in Italy, Italy, Spain, like they're fine. Now. They, they, they got it bad in the beginning. Then, like the government as a whole said, okay, we got to put some measures in place to make sure the people, the, our citizens, are okay. At no point did we have that. 
Uh, no, and, and then like even the, with the recent like minor resurgence of COVID nineteen in Europe, countries like France and Spain and Germany had like less than ten deaths, and they immediately went into lockdowns. Like they didn't even play no games. Like it wasn't like oh we'll wait till we hit one point five million cases or anything. They literally just jumped right back in, did a mandatory shutdown for seven days, and then the deaths went down. That's funny. How does that work? Weird. And they still and they still pay their workers and stuff. Like yeah, Germany, when when Germany shuts down, they pay eighty five percent of their wages um, to all workers. So that way, businesses can stay open and stuff when they can reopen and everything because we they protect their people. Yeah, it's just a more thoughtful economic policy all around. And I remember, like to your point, Caesar, like B- Sweden was being held up on a pedestal by the right at a certain point by um, for a lot of reasons, but at least from the COVID nineteen context. It was because they didn't have like lockdowns and they were able to like not have a lot of problems with the disease. But now um, that the fall has happened and it's spreading again and the wave is worse than the last time, they still had issues. They had to institute masks and lockdowns and all those things. So it really goes back to like what we're saying, which is it has to be about smart policy. It has to be about what the government's doing for people. Because I firmly believed, and I argued with this in a power report recently, that if you, if we started the response in a nonpartisan way where Republicans were like, it's a political benefit if we like institute a program that's like paycheck protection that's in a German paycheck protection where the US government pays a part of your salary so your business is a little bit, have, has a re- bit of relief and people have an incentive to stay home rather than being just left on the hook and having to deal with all these other programs and go through all these other loopholes, which have these other external costs on society. Meanwhile, again, as I said, you had one party particularly pushing a side in an ideology that says to reject all the basic public health measures you do to help make sure you don't get to these numbers. And I think part of deconstructing this and getting back to the problems that are still going to like cause, the problems that like COVID-19 definitely caused but will definitely continue to um, have on society is the fact that we kind of lost sense of certain aspects of reality. Like, I said at one point that a year ago right now, there was someone in China who was, like, in a lab somewhere and, like, figuring out, like, what this virus was and going, oh, no, this is a problem. And then bad things happened after that. But, like, the idea that 100,000 people would die in a pandemic for most people this time last year was unthinkable. And then nine months ago, if you said that kind of thing, it was sensationalistic. And then seven months ago, 100,000 deaths just kind of became inevitable. And then we didn't really do anything or think about it in any kind of way. And then three months ago, 200,000 deaths were like surpassed. And like we kind of went past that point. And now as we approach 300,000 deaths today, like people are just desensitized. And people are so hurt by what's going on in the system right now that... Yeah, the deaths are happening, but more importantly, more materially to them are like the conditions they're going through. And that's creating this already existent like friction between reality and what's going on. It's just making it worse and harder. It's really funny to me when it's okay to use uh, Sweden as an example for like, oh, well, look, they're okay. They didn't do any lockdowns. But then when we want to talk about um, doing doing um, universal health care and Jesus medicare Christ, for all exactly. oh that that doesn't count because that They're country socialist. is too small like okay man so what are we doing here like is it only going to be when it's beneficial for you cuz you know I, I, what do we want here right. you can't just flip flop on when it when it's uh, the when the numbers of people are are convenient for you that doesn't work like that it's a great point because they always rag on it like we yeah, Bernie Sanders would always say, I'm basing my stuff off the Scandinavian model and stuff of governing and, and um, um, uh, domestic policy and everything. But the second was shutdowns and everything, like, oh, we should do their model. But I'm like, okay, then you should do their model for that. So it's a really good point, Caesar. But, you know, those people, <laughs> all they care about is, is their money at the end um, of the day. Th- this does bring us to the kind of climax of this i guess like as this ends to some extent um and that's the fact that as we are talking right now vaccines are getting approved by different governments um like worldwide the vaccines work yes. in different ways some of them require like two doses in order to be like 90 mm-hmm. percent effective and most effective they're finding some side effects in the beginning for people with like certain things but like the news on that's currently that's changing natural. and yeah that's how um like 
these Most shots work. Like, I was just talking about how I had a flu shot last year, and after taking it, like, I had really bad flu symptoms and a reaction to it, and I've had maybe, honestly, four, maybe five flu shots in my life, and that's the first time that's happened, and, like, that's how it works on a biological level. Usually it's, like, not as bad as the real thing, but, like, it, generally it's fine, and it's working for people who um, are, seem to be getting it. It worked in the test, and so... Um, it is starting to be distributed in levels um, based on different ways the government's doing it. The government's basically starting right now with medical workers and frontline workers in that sense. And then from there, it'll probably go to the uber wealthy and anyone who appears on Joe Rogan's podcast. Now, that kind of brings up the question um, that I guess we can kind of begin on this panel is, when the vaccine becomes readily available to us regular folk, will you be taking it? Yeah, I, I know I will have to. I'll well, have to as of like for um, like industry wise for the stuff I do, I'll probably have to because of uh, flying. Well, how do you how do you feel about that? It's fine. I don't care. I feel like it's a flu shot and everything. So it's so whatever. I have to do it. Well, should I go? Uh, well, you know, uh, I just want to say big shout out to Brazil. You know, what I'm saying beat America by two days on the <laughs> vaccine. Let's go. Two days before <laughs> Trump. Big Bolsonaro pulling through. Um, I will be taking a vaccine. Uh, I know anti-vaxxers come at me in the DMs. It's all good. Uh, sadly, this week I lost my uncle and both my parents contracted COVID. So I just feel like the best way to, you know, if, if I just like, if you gotta like, there's if this is this was not this is not just like oh only America's doing this experimental vaccine like you know what England, England's been putting people on anyway <laughs> England's been doing this like last week we're like super last <laughs> but so you know but Brazil two days before before America don't forget Ori original right wing uh, country right here anyway so uh it's it's funny to me because people were talking about how like oh this is this is a danger they're gonna put chips in us I'm like dude they're like doing it in Saudi Arabia to like uh england to here like i mean like it, they would have been got the chips in so what, what are we doing this is a, a pandemic is going on this is a first of its kind i think it's important to take all steps of precaution rather than try to like be uh uh be what is it like uh be be conspiracy theorists because if you're a conspiracy theorist i'm sorry all your conspiracies were destroyed this year <laughs> like anything you didn't you didn't see none of this coming unless you were on some acid i don't know about so it, 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 this has been wild. So I think it's important to just take these precautions. There's tests going on. Of course, in order to do a vaccine for, for a virus, you need to have a small dose of a, like a dead cells from the virus and then put it along with somebody. So you're going to get a little bit sick. That's just how it goes. But I will be a little bit – I'll take that hangover for two days, whatever they say it feels like afterwards, um, in order to not save my own life but the lives of other people around me. Like I just – it gets to the point we're hitting 1.5 million California. <laughs> 300k in USA. I don't know about the other side of the world, but I'm trying to stop those numbers. I'm trying to go back to life again. And so yeah. I don't get flagged on YouTube. Like, you aren't guaranteed to get sick from the vaccine. Like, it's just a possible side effect that can happen sometimes with vaccines. That's just the nature of them. But the thing is, we're constantly battling this, like, amount of disinformation. And yes, Caesar, um, order in progress since... Um, whenever they, <laughs> Americans decided they wanted that. Um, we got a way better dictator. <laughs> I mean, he stayed in longer, so, I mean, th th there's that Let's on go! the but, He ja jailed his political opponents, so, you know, that's how you do it. Hey, that, Trump, take notes. How Roger Stone would have done it. Uh, Ted Cruz, take notes if your sad, pathetic ass ever gets even that close to the executive branch, which it probably was. Zodiac killer, what? Anyways. Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz. Uh, I don't want to get Actually. sidetracked, because, bam, you... you um, are, are like past, at least have, you're at least inquisitive about this question, let's say. So, um, what are your well, thoughts? Well, I mean, I like, I think all of us kind of feel the same way about taking the vaccine, but <clears throat> I just want to say, like, for the people out there, kind of going to what you were saying, Dan, like, we're gonna have to really be vigilant when it in regards to like anti vaxxer disinformation because we haven't got there yet. But it's I, I'm I'm predicting basically as soon as Biden gets inaugurated, like we're gonna be getting bombarded next year with anti-vaxxer disinfo. Yeah. Um, I even think Trump is gonna get on the anti-vaxxer train. Like all the conspiracy QAnon Trump people are also anti-vaxxers, so they had to kind of be quiet when Trump is talking about the vaccine. But when he's not in office anymore, like they're gonna get back on the anti-vaxxer stuff. Um. 
so we're going to have to be really vigilant in regards to that um, because it's it's coming, like, for sure. Um, I, for one, like, I'm not somebody who's, like, afraid of vaccines or kind of, you know, <laughs> like what Caesar was saying, like, you know, even Kanye West was saying, like, uh, they're going to be putting the mark of the beast on us with the vaccine. He said <laughs> that in some, like, GQ uh, interview. Um, Wait, is the operative phrase even Kanye West or, of course, Kanye West? Mm, good question. Um, but <laughs> there's, I mean, yeah, like, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Like, I, like Caesar's saying, like, I'm trying to get back to things. Like, I want to be able to travel. Like, that'd yeah. be nice. Um, but we're going to have to be, like, as intelligent people who care about the truth, um, we're going to have to be really vil- vigilant in regards to that anti-vaxxer bullshit. And, and it's not going to be like just people online. Like there's going to be people coming out talking about, you know, the different so-called side effects. Oh, look, this person died from it. This There's going to be stuff everywhere. And there's probably going to be people that we know and care about uh, believing and, and falling victim to it, too, because this is America. <laughs> and um, yeah, but for I, for one, I want whatever vaccine they're taking in Israel. I want that one. <laughs> um, like right. big facts, big facts. Yeah, they probably got the creme de la creme. Is it Pfizer? I they don't got one. Pfizer. I want to switch them. I want that one. I I don't know exactly which vaccine, but yes, like it's once it's a, Jamie Sean. It, <laughs> yeah, let's. let's I, go, I guess we can figure Netanyahu that out. Netanyahu said he's going to be the Netanyahu said he's going to be taking his vaccine yeah. um, live on TV, whatever. Said it, Obama. What what yeah. if he like what if he just like starts imploding like there when he takes it just like <laughs> they'll blame Iran. <laughs> <laughs> it's fi- Pfizer. They're taking they the Pfizer. Proof, okay, they, I'll take they, that they one. They approved Pfizer's. Okay, right, take Pfizer. Be, Let's go. Yeah, we'll, we'll, if we can travel there, I want to take it there too. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, you want to go to take the vaccine and, they, deal? and like even their the, their uh, verge they're um, urging all Israelis to get it. Netanyahu's like get the uh, get the vaccine. Say no more, fam. <laughs> Listen, all I can tell you is I'm going to continue selling, like, vats of remdesivir on the dark web. So, um, if anyone wants to hit me up on that, I will. What about Clorox? B- Bitcoin Dan, if you can. This dude got vats? Vats. All right. We come correct when we are um, uh, in Minecraft. So the Georgia runoff is currently in the news right now, and it is something that has gotten a lot of attention in the political sphere because it is basically the fate of the Senate. Um, There's currently two runoff elections in the Georgia Senate. Usually Senate um, Mm -hmm. elections are off years. Some little high school uh, political science, I guess, for you all there. Government's class and shit that no one has. But anyways, like, this is usually very unprecedented, but... The votes in the uh, November election were so close that both these Senate seats are at a runoff point. Now, um, the polls are, Sean, actually, that'd be great. If you could get, like, Georgia Senate runoff polls from, like, a 538 or something like that, or anywhere more cucky or less cucky, whatever, but they average it. 538, so um, you have Osof and Purdue. Osof is, has a one-point lead on Purdue. And Warnock and Leffler. Warnock has a two-point lead on Leffler. Okay, and we have to assume that these polls favor Republicans, so we're screwed. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, it's the margins are definitely going to be close. Like, I, I guess I can sort of whoops. I mean, both Democrats are up ahead, so it, the, in these polls, the, the, uh, but it's it's super close. Yeah, it'll be close again. Which is first off, first off, Purdue's a piece of shit. Um, because he is did the whole anti-Semitic uh, thing of uh, making uh, Osof's nose larger in a in a attack ad against him, and I'm like, how is no one talking about that? They literally enhanced his nose like Nazis would do to go against somebody who is Jewish. I'm like, are you serious? Uh, and uh, no one's calling it out. First off, that should be like uh, a disqualifier, and like just uh, uh, no. Yeah. Osof talked about it in his debate with the chair. He talked about it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He did. He brought. He brought it up. But it's one of those things. Stood there, like, yes, I did do it. <laughs> it's one of those things what where, like, he do? has to bring it up as a thing. Where, like, yeah. the, you, usually you expect, I don't know, like, a media who doesn't really have anything better to do, honestly, than like think about these races. 
um, and try to chase ratings in some other way. They should be talking about these things. I mean, it was the same sort of like subtle attacks that you got from the right um, about Bernie Sanders and his Jewish identity um, at the same time that the media was talking about okay, well, we're going to talk about political fandoms that are toxic and we're going to spend our time talking about that. Let's focus on the Bernie bros and not the anti-Semites. <laughs> so, like, that, it, it's a commonality that's going on in the media that, again, this, you have to, like, this last election and these last four years were very wild and we need to, like, decompress and get sort of, like, settle into quote-unquote normal politics. But, like, there is no new normal anymore. And we're going to talk about kind of, like, the p results of that l right now. But... We need to understand that the media is not really going to be that adversarial or as adversarial as they were to the Trump administration. To that extent is like definitely nope. the case because they see Biden as one of them. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that Trump definitely played off of. Like we all kind of knew the media hated him, but like it was obvious Trump was antagonizing the media as well. The, we all have this understanding that the media is just very cozy to power more broadly. Trump's trick was that he made people think that he wasn't power, when it's very obvious he is. But I, as far as how that happens as it relates to this race, Georgia is... We still have to think about normal politics as it is. Georgia's very heavily red. Um, they're, like yes. con they're concentrated blue areas that might be making the difference, and that's why these elections are getting so close. But... Um, and turnout's going to be everything. The, the, the thing that might make the difference here is actually turnout, which will have some ramifications I'll talk about in a moment. But before I like open it up to like the whole panel and everything, the fact that a lot of the Republican base seems to be very depressed, like in a political <laughs> sense and also in an actual, it's very fun to watch online sense um, from the election, combined with the... And they're protesting. Combined, exactly. Combined with the notes that they want to write in Trump for the Georgia Senate race... <laughs> um, I listen. The, the 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 winds of stupid might be in our favor. Um, I I, it, I, I sorry, Sean. I really want to go to Caesar because I know he's just like uh, about to go off. It, oh, go. It, it, it's it's funny because imagine a blue sweep for Georgia. Let's go. <laughs> but um, and it was something I was kind of talking about before when we did the election episode. I think that well, there's a bigger realization on the power of the 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 rural counties of 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 Georgia going red versus the more metropolitan cities um going blue and we're seeing the turn as turnout increases that does not go favorably for the rural counties rural counties have you just stagnant population size but metropolitan cities have been booming especially when it comes to uh Georgia their 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 populations have been rising in the last 10 years um for those counties so if that's if the case is going to be you know, normally, like like we talked about, oh, well, the blue is in the lead, so I know this is going to be problems. But I think it's low-key even better for, for you know, for the Democratic Party in terms of they really need this. Obviously, we know this is – we need the Senate. The Senate is needed right now more than ever, and this is the, the, the state that's going to be, you know, determining the control of the Senate. So I think that if we're going to have a population increase – and and it's gonna be it's gonna be I mean a, a voter turnout if the tur voter turnout's gonna increase it's gonna definitely favor uh, the Democratic Party and honestly like I thought it was really disgusting um, the anti-Semitism I thought it was really disgusting mm -hmm. because you know it's already annoying when these things are like it it like the narrative becomes funny to like dig and do these things and no one talks about it but it's worse that he had to bring it up I thought that was like the worst part because it was very evident from the beginning like it's so obvious and like sean said it, it dates back to old uh, old war war induced racism that the nazis used to use and what's like one of the like most demeaning terms that you can say in america is when you call people like nazi it's like the most extreme level racist but when it comes to you know literally anti-semitism which is that's what an entire war was founded on then people don't want to call it out i thought that was gross um, the Bernie stuff was already annoying, but like I thought that this was worse because it's like literally happening on these advertisements and it's like going on on, on during a critical race and it's 
a year where I thought we were kind of really paying more attention to stuff, you know, like the, 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 we're calling out people for this and all that. And I thought it was gross. They had to bring it up and there was still no reaction, especially from a, a news agencies that are, that are just l swimming in their own tears, like Fox news, mm -hmm. because the, even their own people turn their backs on them. So it's like, you still could have a talking point here and you're not doing it. So it's just, it's just really whack overall. Like at least when your own people turn against you, at least you could bring a headline to bring news. They're not even doing that. They're still bringing the Sydney weirdo lawyer on on uh, the talk on stuff. How? Yeah. So there's a couple interesting <laughs> her little things. rallies. Sean, get in there. There's a couple interesting things with the um with the state runoff. So one yeah. thing is all the Republicans that are saying that they're in a protest and they're like, no, we're not going to vote for you because <laughs> Leffler and Purdue aren't the ones that are like doing the recount stuff. They're not one of the. They're not some senators that are calling like for recounts and everything. And when I know that when Leffler and Warnock had their debate, she kind of like circumvented the question of like, oh, are you going to do you support him in the to support Trump with the elections fraud case and everything. She was like a robot just saying the radical liberal were not like that's literally all she said like over and over and over again. And I'm not over exaggerating. That's all she did the entire <laughs> thing. And it was hilarious. Um, and then the other thing too is how it's showing that there is disenfranchisement of the people of Georgia because Georgia's, you know, a pretty conservative state and whatnot. And a lot of these people are getting disenfranchised in general with in their, um, the Senate leaders, and um, it's getting out to more and more people of saying how crazy these people are and whatnot, um, which is a good thing because now people are seeing what it is uh, in front of their faces. And then the other thing is that when they had a, a, a rally for the for Leffler and Purdue, Trump was there to try, uh, was there originally to go and like try to pump them up, but literally he just did the whole rally talking about himself for like two hours and had left them for do up there for literally 30 seconds <laughs> no, and went back down so and that's how it's the best thing <laughs> it was literally like it was the weirdest rally ever it was 90 minutes of like <laughs> it was literally 90 minutes I'm of the, the band. 90 minutes of the trump show and that's what people were there for <laughs> really? it was very clearly the trump show which is also the sad thing which is again the thing where like if i'm a betting person and i'm using november i have a lot of confidence after november now and what i just saw I think turnout's gonna be the thing, and the fact that Trump is just oh, yeah. repeatedly <laughs> shiving turnout, like at every opportunity he can, by continuing to sow doubt in the election, continuing to sow doubt in the uh, Republican Party. Like, it's classic party splitting. Like, if, for, for the Democrats, like, it's just like, eat that shit up. I'm loving it. Like, ba da ba ba ba, McRib is goddamn back. Like, it's, it's, it's everything <laughs> they could possibly want to get this, like, again, very unlikely Senate scenario where they um, retain both seats and can run over Joe Manchin. Yeah, and mm. it was funny because during that same rally, he spent so much time talking about the results of the election and the turnout and the numbers. He was flipping his own words. Sometimes he'd be like, He'd be like, well, this is what happened during the election, and I'm the president. Then he'd be like, well, I don't respect the the, the results of the election. Then he like, flip-flop, if, yes, I am, was. I'm like, dog, you don't even know your own message. You're just out here rambling. And all those people that came just to get their little 90-second shout-out, all simps. All of them <laughs> were trying to get their, get their shine in the background. I'm like, you showed up in 90 minutes, freezing cold in that rally, just to get a gets just to get a tweet <laughs> if that like this dude it, it was so depressing I'm like this is like the committee of like the sad whiny folks coming together to like get their last it's like their last party before they're shut down forever like we just got to show up man i got to see my people's one more time before it's over like that's what it felt like yeah it it sucks because honestly like if trump was a real one he'd have legit stuff to bring up and he's not he's like literally just talking yeah. about himself talking about the turnout which that's great. You had the number of people, man. Your your greatest numbers ever, and good. But it was still five million less. <laughs> it's like you still finished second second place, Ricky Bobby. So you didn't get first. So it, it's just it, it was just corny. Show. It was like it was like the saddest rally. It wasn't even fun. It was like this is just this is the lowest of the low here. <laughs> it's like watching um, these um, late turn like the latter years of spike tv it's just kind of just like yeah just sick. <laughs> why are we still doing the man show this is so dead it's just <laughs> absolutely disgusting just like a dread on american society entirely but um i i, I really think the interesting thing we're all kind of getting at like we're circling around is that this election is a lot about georgia but it's also a lot about the state of the parties as well and that's why it ties a lot into the covid conversation that we had earlier in the power report podcast 
version of this, where we are like seeing this case where the Republicans have a certain responsibility and say in the matter as opposed to COVID-19 and how they fundamentally bungled as a party. But now the Democrats, as much closer to the election, when honestly it matters, because we all know we have very short political memories in this country, we're much closer to the election now. And Nancy Pelosi's doing this like shit deal where she's going for less COVID relief and less um, help for people um, and doing this same like neoliberal early Obama era, like conceding before you even like get there. I think Cornell West called it punting on second. Like it's just this completely like sort of absolutely mad kind of style of politics where you concede so early that you're just missing all of the political capital that you have coming out of an election that you won in like a historic, they won't say it, but it was kind of a landslide, like 5 million votes. You're tipping over states that have been historically red. Georgia's on the board. Texas is going to be even more on the board in the future. I mean, like Trump definitely pulled off a hat trick in 2016, but Biden's legitimacy and the Democratic Party's um, at least mandate, let's say, not legitimacy, because those are very different things, but their mandate yeah, like, well, in the polling, like in the vote, is very strong as we're in December 2020 right now. And typical as Democrats, they're going to waste it. And so, like, we're going to get to Biden in a moment because there's some stuff about Biden that got me pretty upset. I think got all pretty, us all pretty upset. Um, and, and Bam's raising his hand. Yes, but Bam, uh, last thoughts, Bam. Well, I just want to talk a little bit more about the Georgia Senate race. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely all about turnout. And um, in David Perdue and Kelly Leffler, you have like the worst of uh, American politics. I mean, Kelly mm -hmm. Leffler wasn't even elected. She's not even from Georgia. Nope. Um, David Perdue is just, you know, it's like, it's literally, it's like the worst of the swamp, like whatever kind of image of like these politicians that could care less about any person, like that's 100% David Perdue. Didn't even bother to show up to his um, debate whenever that was a few days ago. Um, but, you know, they're, like I'm, I'm optimistic about them getting voted out. One, you had Stacey Abrams out there getting people registered. Um, mm -hmm. Raphael Warnock is like um, pretty legendary in those parts. He's also from Savannah, which is like super like Savannah is like one of the places like when you go there, you can like smell the racism in the air. Um, and it's like uh, I was going to say something way worse than that. Let me relax. Hey, man. Uh, <laughs> Whoa. <but> like, <laughs> <laughs> like Nina Simone wrote that song about Savannah, basically. Mm. Um, <laughs> but he's from Savannah, and like, hopefully, you know, a lot of people in Savannah turn out for him. Um, and yeah, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that will mean for American politics going forward. I'm not like so excited that there will be Demo like there'll be a democratic senate or whatever like i'm not like oh my god it'll make things better or different necessarily mm -hmm. but um for the people of georgia like it'll be better for them to have better representation um uh, going forward for sure yeah i i can definitely say that there are real tangible benefits that even a milk toast like democrat and we have some like reason to believe that warnock and um like we have some reason to believe that they might be strong on certain issues, at least like they won't be again, Joe Manchin's that we have to worry about <laughs> um, in the Senate. But yeah, I think you are right, Bam, about like tempering our expectations as well about the things that we can expect from the Democratic Party realistically. Mm -hmm. um, because like, again, in their strongest moment, they're showing what they can give us. And it's like nothing. It's paltry. It's chump change. But like, I, I think this all relates to, like I said, the, the presidential, what's happening at the presidential level, that behavior is impacting what this race is that we're ultimately saying, um, and at a national level. Um, I, I will make one point really fast and maybe like have some like minor discussion over it. But I just want to say, I'm glad, again, that we do the show in the way that it is, because the past month in like cable news media has been, they're the ones riding the momentum of the political, um, like happenings of the time better than the Democratic Party is because they understand that like the elections is a rating cycle and it's like a thing that's going to really help with um, bringing in money for them and so they're going to keep up as much attention as possible after the election and so they're going to spend a lot of hype in like Trump's attempts to um, 
get go through the courts to try to like overturn the election because they still want to ride this like drama circus train and like the t landscaping thing was funny and rudy giuliani like leaking and farting and just like completely just like <laughs> <laughs> having like a goddamn all-star all-american run like like rudy giuliani for like a ugly american number one on the world stage honestly he should like appoint us to the un because he represents everything we stand for as a culture and like everything that's going to lead to our ultimate demise but like the and he got COVID. <laughs> and he did get COVID, which is, um, I, I say this with humility and respect. Very funny. Um, the thing that the media did, and I think they did a disservice to, which is um, a good sense of what's going to happen in the future, which is a segue, is that they're going to continue to fail us similarly as they were on the Trump administration, although occasionally they like are going, okay, cool, you're asking the obvious question there. Thank you they're gonna fail us in the Biden administration. They're gonna fail us miserably because, um, I mean, there's a number of different ways, but it's mostly because they are giving the Trump show more attention than it ever really deserved, ever needed to really have. Um, none of these court cases were gonna work out. We were gonna, people were saying that from the beginning, real legal, like intelligent people were gonna say this at the beginning. Um, it ended up going seven to um, the two justices who um, supported it, Uncle Tom and Scalia himself, of course, said that, like, you know, on principle, we have to hear the states out on what they're saying. But, like, we, we're not going to actually, like, this holds no merit. Like, what, what the hell are you talking about? Because none of them are willing. They're actually, like, the Supreme Court, the Republicans, and the, the conservatives on the Supreme Court, what's the difference, are actually smart enough to understand the game. And they've seen the past, like, month or so, and they've seen this, like, slapdash operation and they know the ultimate goal of the Republican Party is to coalesce power in all three branches of government and to make this like the anarcho-capitalist state that they want it to be. And that Donald Trump is no longer their avenue to do that. He does not have the sauce, his team is flailing, and they're not going to fall on the sword for this clown in order to let him go through. And that was apparent once he lost the election. And so... With all of that said, the fact that we didn't spend a lot of time going, oh, is this weird legal thing going to go through? Or is this like legal challenge going to work? Or look, this one might have some steam or whatever. And just getting people's hype up, like we're able to focus on the real shit, the actual things that the media is not paying attention to or they're too dumb to pay attention to. Such as, speaking of things the media is too dumb to pay attention to, um... There was a clip of, there's some audio um, that was leaked of Joe Biden from before the election. Um, good thing, because this could have been rough. But it was basically him talking in a group um, with progressive like um, leaders and activists. And he made the kind of weird summation that I'll insert here into this part of the podcast. A lot of people in our community are getting a little anxious because they are not seeing enough of the progress they thought they would have seen at this point. Let's not disappoint them and let's not get to a place where voters in Georgia begin to second guess. OK, let me respond. I, I, I got to I got to go. Let me respond. There's a lot to respond to here. Let's get something straight. You shouldn't be disappointed. What I've done so far is more than anybody else has done this far. OK, number one. Number two. I mean what I say when I say it. I mean what I say when I say it. I'm the only person who's ever run on three platforms that I was told could not possibly win the election. And I never ceased from it. One was on restoring the soul of this country because of what I saw happen in Charlottesville. That was it. No one else was talking about it. The words of presidents matter. Nobody else. No progressive was talking about. I did. That he was the only person who was fighting and standing up against like far right extremism on the left that no one else was doing it but him. We, we got that old cranky Uncle Joe tone back um, where he was saying that he was um, responsible for these things and doing more work than anyone else does, talking down to people, which is the same thing we saw from Hillary Clinton, which is the same thing we saw at its worst from Bernie Sanders. It's the same thing that we know a lot of these politicians do, which is just talking down to the activists, belittling the activists and belittling what they're doing, the actual work they're doing to mobilize for the Democratic Party when they aren't giving them shit. And again, once you have this context of um, 
COVID-19 and the fight that's very publicly visible right now during this crisis. And we're seeing how little Democrats are willing to fight with the exception of maybe the squad members. And thankfully that newly elected cohort is getting a little bit bigger. The Democrats are not willing to actually fight for people and put in the work for the um, votes that they need to remain politically relevant. And so like, I think they've only got a couple of elections left in them in order to like, for the insurgent left to maintain power. But if the left doesn't get what it wants and what it wants soon, like the Democratic Party is going to dissolve and eat itself the same way the Republican Party currently is. And um, uh, Caesar, how's cyberpunk going? Because <laughs> that might be kind huh. of what's going to be the thing that's happening. Like I, that, that's at least kind of my take. But no, the, again, sorry. That the, the clip of Joe Biden, the main point of that was just so infuriating. I want to get what y'all think about that. Um, I'll, I'll start off uh, real quick. Um, I think that for me, there's like two things that really, I guess I'm learning. I guess I'm sitting here and I'm just like observing right now. I'm not quick to, to, to make a distinction of how the four years are going to go, but I'm just sitting back and I'm learning about like how this is going to go forward with Joe Biden. Is it going to be like, we just got to hope he doesn't go to, uh, to get off my lawn or we just got to like, keep like. We hope he doesn't get too fired up and then like hope he's calmed down because what two things I didn't like about the Zoom call. Number one, it's like I don't like the sense of like I did it all. I hate when politicians do that because the number one thing about democracy, it's like the people come together to make decisions. Right. We vote this. So when you come with the approach of I did it, then that takes like an authoritarian role. Like I'm the captain. I'm the hero. I've done it all when you weren't even like so I, I don't like that. That always bothers me. And that's, I think, what Dan's kind of alluding to what is going to be dangerous moving forward for the Democratic Party, because as we see the Democratic Party, there's kind of two sides that's emerging. There's a side that's like the old school boomer Democrats, like like Joe Biden, that style. And then more of like the 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 more progressive and like more of like looking at to looking at the world in like a different perspective, Medicare for all, whatever the hell you want to call them, a Green New Deal Democrats that are kind of like making slow but you know, progress within circles, especially in places like California, these areas, like it's, it's making more progress. <clears throat> Another thing I didn't like is I didn't like his tone. Um, you know, it's, it's already kind of a discussion in the past. It's already something that we, that was dealt with in terms of March and, and, and May and with the BLM protests and kind of everything that was going on. Say what you want about a lot of like African American leaders within these communities and what they do. I'm not here to vet them, and I think that's the corny approach. People saying, "Well, you don't even look at these guys." Oh, well, I'm not here to vet them. That's not. They're in that role. They're just approaching the the what's gonna be president of the United States and tech, talking about what the community response is. Hey, like the community, especially in places like George, these areas turnout was big. You're gonna be president. This is the frustration the community's had with the past with Democrats. We're just bringing this to the table. His response was like, "Okay." You're level six. Let me come back to you at level nine <laughs> and like start screaming about you, what what I've done for against uh, against radicals and what I did in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, like you need to like just take a breath right now because the approach isn't like attack when people are bringing uh, um, issues to the forefront. It's about what I wanted is discussion. The important thing is discussion. My theory, though, is that I mean, this is early and I don't like even doing this, but. I think that with this presidency, we're going to have like the approach of like, we're going to see how we're gonna, it's going to go. And I think we're going to see a battle at the end of between do the people want to go back to Republican and whatever the hell, who, who emerges, what creature emerges from that side at that time period? Or are we going to go to like, is there going to be more of a upbringing to the other side of democ the Democrats that like the AOCs and the Bernies, like those people, are we going to see an upsurge for support for that? And because Maybe this is a path where we're like, okay, that for the Trump era was wild. I'm glad Biden's here, but it's just not enough of what we need. So that's just what I'm waiting. I'm kind of an observing state, but what he said is, it, it was it was a gross Zoom call, and he's damn sure lucky it happened after it's all over. Bam, what do you think about that? And when, what do you think to like Caesar's point that like he is sort of getting new, like like he is taking a stand back at this. Like, do you think he should just wait and see, or is this more of the way that, like, this is Joe Biden going like, look, this is who I really am behind closed doors. This is how I do that so-called transactional politics that I'm so lauded for in the um, establishment circles. Um, is this just like what we're going to have to get used to as um, people on the left? 
Well, I mean, we've seen with Trump that like what somebody says in that office just doesn't matter. Like Trump said whatever the hell he wanted, he did whatever the hell he wanted, and it really just didn't matter. So for me personally, I don't have any expectations of that office, like the person at office. Just like don't make things way worse. I don't like I didn't care about Joe Biden. I didn't I didn't like vote for him in the primary. I didn't want him. <laughs> See, they're stupid. I didn't I, I didn't want him. I don't have any like like I that's what I expect from him. Like he's smug, he's entitled, he's old, rich, white dude. Like that's what I expect for him to be like. So yeah, I'm not I'm not like shocked. And also I'm like, well, like that's seems like that's just what it's gonna be. If, if if he was somebody that I like, let's say I voted for Bernie in the primary. If this was Bernie, then it'd bother me. I'd be like, damn, dude, like, come on, man. I was like, you know, going for you, dog. But like Joe Biden, I'm like, that's who y'all wanted. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's kind of how I feel. Right. I sort of see that. Um, Sean. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, it's just another stop down to progressives that's been happening, that's been going on for this country for a very, very long time. Um, it'll, it, I mean, pretty much already know how the presidency is going to go down. It's going to go down very similar to Obama, so that no toast in the old liberal centrism, um, you know, protecting corporations, screwing over people, invading uh, other countries, and drowning them a couple times just for the hell of it, for shits and giggles. Um, and then slapping down and make, making some, you know, small cultural things to keep some of the population happy, but then really not doing much for working people. That needs to be done. So um, it's going to boil over at some point, for sure. Um, you have that, as Caesar was saying, you have a contingency of, of younger people that are more progressive thinking, more um, open mind, especially towards um, policies and stuff that will help working people that I think will now, especially as more of them are getting into voting ages, in the next um, election, it'll be interesting to see how they turn out and stuff and how if more and more people are getting involved in the political process and stuff, how their eyes are going to be opened to showing how like, basically how much neoliberalism, how much centrism really screws over working people unless you're extremely wealthy or you're an insider within them. So it'll be um, it'll it'll show more people of that. But the Zoom call and stuff that I mean, it's it pisses me off, but I mean, it's some something that I was really shocked per se. Um, it just will show more people. I'm like, look, this is who you voted for. This is what you're all standing. It's not that great of a person. So there you go. And, and you know, there's a lot of I agree with Sean. Um, you know, the the only thing to say is like, you know, obviously we we're, we kind of a lot of us in agreement here. Democratic Party is just like. They just like it's like they always have their shoelaces untied. They just don't know how to like really move forward and they're afraid to like really grasp and like another part of this nation that is like looking for that. Like I think a lot of young people that have just turned in that 18 to 25 range in America or just turning 18 are really looking to like kind of find a home a little bit and be and those that are like not really with like that whole Trump era that we had cuz I'm he's already in the past I me. Mean, we moved on. Uh, the whole Trump era, like they're looking for a home kind of, and it's hard for them to really be like, yeah, but like Biden. So it's tough for them. Um, but I think, I don't know if it's going to go exactly like Obama, the Obama era. Like I can see some similarities, obviously, especially like while they were to mind, but I always thought even Biden was a little bit more like, uh, a little bit more like conservative than Biden, uh, Obama was. And I think that he was just kind of staking a, a step back role in a lot of things because obviously Obama was such a such a popular figure. Um, even when he did the water thing in Flint and all that stuff, like he <laughs> he was, which is wild. Uh, he's he was still a popular figure, and he still is till today. I mean, he released a, a nine hundred page book or whatever. Another version of Harry Potter just came out. So it, it's it's ridiculous. But I think with Biden, I think it especially if, if especially if the Senate, if the Democrats do get the Senate. I don't know if necessarily things are going to go the same. I think that there are a lot of uh, there's some new new voices in the Senate that I am curious to see. I am curious to see what they bring to the board. I am curious to see what they vote. Biden didn't make some promises, and I think promises in the past that 
presidents have made have been able to flip flop. But I think a lot of eyes, especially after what the entire nation went through, like we've never had something that really affected the nation in in total, such, such as the pandemic, such as we talked about unemployment insurance for Americans. We talked about the student loan debt that was promised. You know, that is going to be, I think. Uh, Democrats really got to really got to be on it if they do get the Georgia runoff. They really got to be on it about some of those promises because, you know, a lot of people decided to make a big decision. Georgia, if they go through, they made a big decision in terms of switching out. I'm very curious to see what happens moving forward with some of the bills that are passed and the stimulus stuff going forward, because I think the eyes of the nation are going to be on them. And the other side is going to the other side of the media is going to be on them, too, if they don't fulfill some of the promises they made originally. So go ahead, man. Well, I just want to say, like, I mean. Was, I don't know if that was Dan or me. Um, you know, there is like, like it would be nice if the politician, politicians just had to answer to the people. Hmm. But we live in a country where like corporations have like more power than the people. And like, I don't think necessarily electoral politics is going to change that. Like there's like a lot that needs to happen for that to change. Um, that's, I don't want to say it's, it's not, it's not outside of the hands of the politicians, but it's not just going to be the politicians that are going to be able to change that. Um, and we're probably going to end up talking about that more when we talk about India. So I'll just like, leave it there. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Um, I think you are getting to a point of like where the power is and like, that's kind of what the show is about, but like, you know, we should be having some like accountability to power. So you have April D. Ryan, who, um, at least in her Twitter bio, says that she's a White House correspondent and a political analyst for CNN, um, who was reacting to the leaked audio, shout out Ryan Grimm, um, and she said, the question is, who leaked this and why? Also, I'm told by a civil right, by a rights leader in that meeting with Joe Biden was more, was being more passionate than defensive. Can't wait to hear what the Biden camp has to say. So... This is beyond like cover journalism because you're going, who leaked this and why? Because that's the weird thing. Not, not that it was said, but who leaked this? Um, and that, yeah, Joe Biden was being more passionate than defensive. I mean, you can hear the audio for yourself, although we've seen recently that um, a lot of people in the establishment media are bad at reading audio and being able to tell tone or context in any sort of way because they're that divorced from I don't know, I guess talking to normal people outside of their bubble. I'm not sure. Just something I've noticed a couple of times. But, like, the whole, like, dumb aspect of this was really highlighted by um, Edward Anguezo Jr., who um, is a writer, a tech and labor writer at Motherboard. He tweeted um, sarcastically, saying, It is responsible and sets a dangerous precedent for journalists covering the incoming administration to be able to use secretly recorded conversations in their stories. To parse out... To Biden's thoughts and anticipate his policy commitments, you must go through the proper channels. And then he went on this continued, like, sarcastic thing, saying, The White House press secretary, the spokespeople for the president and vice president, senior officials without attribution, and the president's public statements are all designated and responsible sources of information about the president's thoughts and intentions. <laughs> Revealing a contradiction between Biden's private thoughts and public statements is dangerous because it erodes tr public trust in the president, the office, and the media itself. And obviously this is just sarcasm. You're pointing out the fact that like, media is about like making sure that the people in power are consistent with what they think and what they say, what they're doing behind closed doors and what they're saying publicly, because there's often a disconnect between that. It's one of the basically foundations of media. It's what you want to do if you're going to be like looking at the White House very closely. Um, and this is a pretty like, subtle but clear sarcasm to everyone online except april d ryan who responded with agreed and said you hit the nail on the head this is not good at all very very completely just missing the entire point of the sarcasm and she's the person who's paid probably the most or one of them among the most in media um to ask questions at the white house and is going to be asking questions of the biden administration and she's a black woman so i can't say anything else or else i'll probably get like canceled or something like and, and yeah, it's like it. and, and we get to say like oh it's diversity now and aren't you happy because we have this like leftist person here and it's like no <laughs> this, 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 these people are very disconnected from people's 
like what people actually expect from the media and more importantly what the media needs to do at this time when they very much have a problem with gaining trust with um, everyday citizens. I just think it's funny like so like you think that like you're a member of the media and you think it's better to suppress information from the from the public? I I don't understand that. Like the approach, like how you not ca- how you not catch that is so weird. Like so wait, like oh who would leak this and why? Well, I'm, uh, like and and like oh yeah, like I don't know. It just seems to me like I thought that that's like what the media does. Like it's about the leaks. Like it's about the headlines attack. So I don't think I have I, like I don't know. Like it's it's a White House yeah, any a White House correspondent. Like wow, like shout out to you. You made it, but you can't read sarcasm on Twitter. Good for you. I just think to me it's like. Like anybody taking the approach of like thinking that, oh, why would you leak this? I mean, dude, like it doesn't matter. You, it, it's not about like why. Like it's it's supposed to be fair and shared to the public. Like if that comes out, it comes out. It is what it is. And and we people are allowed are entitled to have an opinion about. People are entitled to find out how the politicians that they went out and voted during the pandemic and stuff are really saying behind closed doors. Sorry, like if people want to keep going back to the boomer politics era where it's like, oh, salesmen go the the car salesman approach and all this. I'm sorry, it's 2020. We got new approaches now. We got YouTube and stuff. We got clips. So it, w- there's already such low accountability for what politicians say anyway, especially when they bring up and lie about points they made, such as we saw in debates. I like seeing some accountability once in a while, even though even if it's a little shady, it is what it is. Like it's it it has to come out, and you're gonna have drawbacks because it's never gonna be a clean system. Yeah, I, I, you were saying like, oh, we got YouTube. I'm like, we got fleets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, there there's always gonna be like partisan media people, and there's always gonna be leaks, and there's gonna be. I mean. When Trump was in office, there was a lot of leaking, especially in the beginning, and he was upset. And he, I, I feel like he might have even tried to sign some executive order about it. Um, all that's that that's going to happen no matter what. Um, and I'm down. Like that's we need to know what's going on behind closed doors for sure. But just like it didn't matter under Trump, it's it's not going to matter under Biden. And like me personally, like I, I mean, I'm not going to be like. I'm not so invested in the president as long as the president isn't like stoking white supremacy and like saying a pandemic is a hoax. It, it, like we got, we got to fight. I'm not going to get into all that, but like for our right <laughs> to party, we're, <laughs> we, we're going to get leaks no matter what. And there's going to be a bunch of uh, b- both sides of them with the leaks I'm down either way, but they're probably not going to matter, just like they didn't matter in the Trump. On November 27th, 2020, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh was uh, murdered, tragically assassinated. He was the Iranian um, nuclear scientist. He was the head of the program project Ahmad from 1989 to 2003 it was a program i mean i'm saying what the iranian government mm. and military said it was I'm, I'm sure there's people that just don't believe any middle eastern country off top but um it was a program for them to um research the ability for them to potentially have a nuclear weapon now it might sound bad on the on the surface, but 1989 they're just coming out of the Iran Iraq mm-hmm. War, where um, I think over I think over a million Iranians died, or is it over a million on both sides? Both sides. Both sides. Um, and it was a very very tragic war for Iran, and it's something that's never been forgotten by Iran. And it was they were like on their own while Saddam Hussein in Iraq was getting help from everywhere. Um, to the extent I remember, um, not, not, I think it was Javad Zarif actually, who was the foreign minister, unless he resigned, I think he came back. But, um, at that time he was like going to the UN in New mm-hmm. York and bringing people who were like, who had suffered uh, chemical attacks mm-hmm. saying like, we need some kind of international way to stop this war because Saddam is playing, not playing fair. Um, basically was threatening to chemical bomb Tehran. Um, yep. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going way into history, sorry. But um, yeah, 
uh, not that long ago, uh, Netanyahu was saying that was mentioning uh, Fakhr Zadeh and was saying that he was, you know, still, uh, you know, you know, part of their nuclear program and they're still trying to build a weapon. I don't know if you guys remember when um, he had that picture of the yeah, like, cartoon yeah. bomb. Yeah. <laughs> it said like POW on there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're building bomb. What a, Look at this. What a boomer. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, hey, but, man. No, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> but he had mentioned him by name and yeah, it was a very tragic assassination. Um, so, you know, and it's, you know, we don't know for sure who did it. Like we can't, we can surmise that it was Israel that did it. They, they uh, assassinated Iran. Basically, right? Like, like the New York no, Times. No, they, they, they said they said they neither confirmed nor denied responsibility. So if you don't either confirm or deny, you just play Switzerland. Then you know. Yeah, probably, I mean, probably was on you. And, and they assassinated Iranian nuclear scientists in the past. Yes, but um, either way, like this is an action that is. America's fault. Um, what's his name? Uh, Trump said precedent in the beginning of Power Report in January. I think it was January third by murder, assassinating the Iranian general Soleimani, Soleimani. and um, you know it, it's it's, it's basically a like I don't know if I could jump in, but like to, to me, yeah. like just also help, help us like surmise for the audience, like Trump in the first act he'd made of like twenty twenty one, the first ones set this precedent to where, or help set this precedent or cement in this precedent, at least in modern times, that you can preemptively go into another country and perform an attack on their general or um, whatever military asset you deem as a military threat and kill them and do whatever attack in the surrounding area, wherever you want to around the world, if you deem it a threat in the future, which is just so much of a, um, jump from, I don't know, I mean, basic habeas corpus, but also just like the way we've done general diplomacy. And I mean, b beyond those things, like do unto others is what you want done to me. Um, if you fool me, we can't get fooled again. <laughs> like <laughs> the, the idea that what if people were like going, oh, there's someone who's been posting too hard in the United States. We're going to nuke their subdivision or like we're going to like attack their subdivision with like a drone strike or something. Obviously you can't nuke, but like you get my point here. We're going to destroy, we're going to level this entire area where you live because we don't like what this person's saying online. We think they might be a propagandist in the future. So we're going to send a drone into the United States and like a uh, rocket launch to Joe Rogan's like Austin headquarters or whatever. Like there's some things you have in the Pandora's box, obviously once you take it out, you can't put it back in. That's the metaphor. That's a really dangerous thing to like kind of start and start doing because now it's very clearly happening. Um, Sean, I know you really want to get into like how this killing happened because there's, of course, with these things, there's certain information that's fed mm -hmm. to the press by the people who totally didn't do it, but totally know a lot about how it was done and would love to tell the press about this thing for free publicity for the military industrial complex. And so they tell us like really good information on how these kills happen. And Sean, you're just like kind of aghast at it, right? Um, so it looks like that a... Uh, machine gun with AI was used to kill him. So basically, like on the day of the attack, they said that there was a gunfight between um, scientists, bodyguards, and several gunmen, but that's not the case. They said that, um, I can further reports and stuff, now it's coming out, that basically a uh, truck with a gun attached to it and whatnot came by with artificial intelligence um, that basically could zoom in onto the car from like satellite stuff and went in, saw where he was sitting, scanned his face basically, shot him, thir shot him four times, shot 13 times all around him, hit him while the bodyguards tried to go in and save it. Um, and then no one else was shot, just him. And that was it. Yeah, I like, like so a car, a truck like run up, runs up on him, just nothing else. That's just, it's mental to me because it's showing the first off the sophistication that there is with basically modern military tactics and stuff now and modern assassination stuff and everything. Now you don't have exploding pens like you did in the Cold War, mm -hmm. you know, or um, little hand, uh, tiny little guns or whatnot you'd put in your in, in like your pocket. I was hoping for Get Smart too. Um, Get that, okay. that young Inspector Gadget. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> right. Um, so it's showing like the, the power that some of the most powerful militaries in the world really have that if they want you dead, you're going to be dead. I mean, you've seen this naturally throughout history with, you know, in the 60s, Black Panthers being assassinated all the time. You have all this other stuff that's um, happened with leftists and whatnot in, in America. Um, and now in the Middle East, you've seen it plenty of times. It's just, it, it's crazy. Yeah, Bam? You're crazy. Um, I mean, it, uh, uh, although like these assassinations of, of nuclear scientists, Iranian nuclear scientists have been happening for a while now, mm -hmm. um, I feel like also when Saudi Arabia killed uh, Jamal Khashoggi in Turkey, uh, chopping up his body, and there was him. Yeah. literally no repercussions. I feel like that also like set a precedence. Yeah, definitely Trump's kind of like goonocracy way of government <laughs> and just kind of like letting any kind of like if it's our quote unquote ally, like they can do whatever they want kind of nature. Yeah. And not, and not to say that whenever Israel assassinated Iranian nuclear scientists before that there was any harsh um, consequences well, for it. Was. But just that, like, yeah, go ahead, do whatever you want. Like Khashoggi was a, yeah. was a, was a, um, a journalist and he, mm -hmm. and he wasn't even that harsh against Saudi Arabia, but they killed him in a heinous way, tried to cover it up. Um, and and there's vid there's audio of his death. It's pretty like, brutal. Yeah, I mean, like, and I'll be inserting that right here I don't, I don't in the know. pocket. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> just, I, you, you don't want I, to hear it. <laughs> I think just the worst for me is like it, it just really bothers me that we're doing this for how many years and we're still being able to go in there into other countries, do assassination attempts. You know, set up coups like we've done in the South America. Now we're doing it's this, and, and we're doing this Middle East. It's just like, it's just one of the most disgusting aspects of like kind of like being associated with this country that this is continuously a uh, 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 a consistent pattern. United States has, you know, like whether it's they're using Cyberpunk twenty seven seventy seven weapons to get in there and, and and knock people out with with scanning moving robots or whatever, like. It's like, regardless of that, like, it's just sickening that this is the country that we live in. And, like, Trump thinking that the the cool thing to do in the beginning of the year was just knock someone out real quick. Well, that didn't work out very well because you still didn't get the, you still didn't get the office back, right? And he still and he still boasts about it. He's had rallies well, where he talked about how proud he was that he, he was able to take did. down these hit list members. Go ahead, Sean. Well, he was he was even threatening for a while now to start a war with Iran at the last part of his administration. He was well, really going on like, I want to do it. But even some of the, the hawkish people in his administration were saying, yo, yo, you got to chill. Like you can't right now of all times. That's like the worst thing you could possibly do is to start a war with an incoming administration. So even some of the craziest right wing people in this country had to calm him down because he wanted to start something with Iran. Yeah, and, and it, him him doing it as Trump dissing his former general that he fired, calling him a kook or whatever. Like, dude, it's just really funny. Like, you were the guy who came in talking about, oh, we got to get out the troops out, get the troops out. Now you're oh, hawkish yeah, as hell. Literally hawkish as hell two months in, right? Got yeah. hawkish real quick, and, like, we're, we're still doing this. I think it's one of the – if bar, bar none, the, all the issues the United States has, that's already ridiculous. The one that always really just – really hits me the hardest is, like, being associated with this kind of style like we're like to me it's like we're still doing this crap dude like we're still doing mm -hmm. this like i it almost feels like old news as hell like it, we're, we're we're really spending a bunch of money making some robot to go knock out a dude uh, uh that's a nuclear scientist yeah sure if you're still a part of the country that believes that uh all oh, these he's gonna build a bomb to blow us up if you're still thinking this kind of dumb stuff for sure because think about this if you have technology that's able to go and take some satellite to scan some dude to go assassinate him and 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 shoot only him unlike police in america to shoot 45 other people before they shoot the right person like 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 they're a bunch of uh stormtroopers they're able to <laughs> do this but we you don't think that we have the military capability just to defend ourselves if something were to happen? Like you're literally you're just exposing Second yourself. Amendment. Someone who Second Amendment. Here's here's I have like a couple. I have That's a couple not even Second Amendment. That's a robot, man. <laughs> no, no, I, I, have, what the I, have, hell? I have a couple things on Go ahead. too. Um, one thing going into the Second Amendment, Dan. This really likes to prove my point of anyone who's saying like I want my second uh, Second Amendment right to rise up against a tyrannical government. If the U.S. government wants you dead, you're gonna die no matter what. Like you're you're out, so it's game it's game over. Like there's nothing you can do. And the other thing I have is.
with Iran and the whole oh they're gonna have an they can have like the capabilities to have a nuclear bomb and whatnot two things trump roped up the iran deal so that was one thing to help them regulate the way they couldn't second off it is their right to make a nuclear bomb if they want america has thousands of nukes russia has thousands of nukes um india has nukes um north korea has nukes because this is what happens when israel like, in israel has nukes um france uk um they have nukes but anyways when a, for in Egypt, Muammar Gaddafi gave up his um, his weapons of mass destruction, basically because we like threatened him to give up his weapons of mass destruction, and we said, "Nah, fuck it. You know what? No, we're gonna come in and let him die." Basically, so the entire world saw what happened when someone gave up their like their one bargain of leverage, which was the weapons of mass destruction. Um, that they gave it up, but the U.S. came in anyways and fucked up all of Egypt. And then you already see, you know what happened to. Uh, well, I mean, you know Libya, what happened. Libya, Libya, Libya. Sorry, Libya. Um, you know what happened to Libya and what happened to Gaddafi and whatnot. So then the rest of the world sees that North Korea is like, we're not going to give up our nukes because exactly. what happened when if the U.S. took our nukes, they're going to invade us anyways. It, so the same thing now with Iran, like the, it's this bully mentality that the U.S. imperialists have had for so long that they think they can go around and police everybody. Like you can't have nukes. No, you guys can because we kind of like you and we give you weapons and you give us a lot of money, but they can't have nukes. So, yeah, it's just this whole thing. I mean, the same thing with Saddam Hussein, too. He's like, oh, we give up weapons of mass destruction, or we're going to come and topple you anyway. So it's just this whole thing of regime change that does not work. It makes things worse. Always has. These these Caitlin Bennett stands out here talking about their they're, they're so they're so excited to keep their keep their extendos on their AKs, buddy. They're not going to do nothing against the Robo cops that we're b building over here. You can keep your your you you want to keep your your corny AR 15s and your extendos and all this and you you yeah. I wish the government would do something, buddy. Your own president you voted for. Is signing bills to make Space Force and 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 uh, uh, some kind of robotron that can assassinate someone. You think your pistol or AK is gonna do anything, dude? I don't even think a bazooka take that guy. Like they said, the bodyguards couldn't even stop this thing. It just happened. <laughs> like, it, 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 stop it. Stop with the stop with the 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 Paul Revere uh, old school Second Amendment riding my horse around. Got to protect my <coughs> land approach, dude. It's it's not gonna work, G. If it's over, it's over. Like literally, it's over. There's no there's no questions about it. This guy was in another country. <laughs> the protected. He was actually a protected person. He was just mm -hmm. a regular, a regular civilian walking around at Vons. He was a, he was a inside his own place. Was taken out with a GPS strike. So keep thinking, keep thinking. And even what Dan brought, what you guys brought up with the, uh, uh, the Black Panthers. This has happened for years. It's happened in foreign countries. They can, there's viruses involved, all kinds of things involved that they've been able to take people out that are actually important and protected. So quit pretending like you're any more any more guns you have at the crib is any more powerful than what they're doing out there. So just stop this, please. Stop it. Bam, you said you had a point on Morocco that I, I don't want to like lead astray. Or is there something that's oh, like that's oh, way too interesting? Much? Well, just just like um it uh recently Morocco, I don't know if they signed anything, but they, you know, agreed to have relations with Israel. And on the surface, that doesn't look too bad. But um, interesting. Um, the USA, you, the USA became the first country in the world to recognize Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. Um, it's basically the last colony of Africa. Uh, the Moroccans have been calling, like, have been uh, occupying it for a long yeah. time, uh, violently, violently occupying it. Um, it's not a very well known situation. Um, the area, I mean, usually when you look on a map, like, I'm sure somebody's seen, like, oh, what's this under Morocco? Like, what is this thing right here? Western Sahara occupied something, like, um, but it is a nation that's recognized by the, by, I think over 200 countries and it's uh, a full member of the African Union and America became the first country to recognize Morocco's occupation of it just like they you know moved their embassy to Jerusalem and recognized Israel's yeah. occupation of the Golan Heights and all this other stuff I don't know what these people were thinking about Trump and all this America first stuff or whatever um, I'll, I'll leave it there
Well, aren't there a lot of um, Israelis um, who have ancestry going back to Morocco or something too? Or like there's a, there's a Moroccan descent, I believe. There's a, there's a big, uh, there, there has been, and I think there still is a big Jewish population in Morocco. Yeah, um, okay. Morocco has always awesome. been a big ally of the United States, but um, yes. I don't know. It just sucks that like, these are like the foreign policy things that are happening under Trump. Um, and anything that was like decent, he was, you know, anything that kind of happened that was decent, like the Paris Accords, which is not like such a big deal, but like, it's good. Or it like helps. the, or like the Iran deal, like he's, or like the WHO, he's like, no, we don't want any part of that. But like things like this, which end up oppressing more people, like he's all for it, you know? And, 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 I don't know if uh, not a lot of people talk about the foreign policy that's happened under Trump. Sadly, like drone strikes up 300 percent and more civilians yep. dead in Afghanistan than the entire war, like the entire 20 years. Um, these are crazy. things that, are, that need to be talked about more when people speak about him as a president. We always talk about Obama being the drone master and all this other stuff. But for some Trump reason, worse. That, for, for some reason, that stuff gets ignored with Donald Trump. I think I want to start doing a segment called That You've Never Heard Of because there's all these really amazing things going around the world that mm -hmm. people don't hear about that aren't reported that isn't going on. But it's just completely amazing things that um, say a lot about the way that people around the world are living their lives. And I think if more people had this information that we're about to talk about right now, I think people would have less of a divide across nations and thinking that people are more different than them just because they live in another part of the world. Of course, cultures are different, but we're all having a lot of the same struggles that can be tied to certain aspects of um, how power coalesces in our society. So mm -hmm. with that being said, I go to India, um, where, just some context for India, about 60% of India's working population is involved in the agricultural sector, 60%. Um, India is a massive country, um, billions of people in there, like almost 2 billion, I believe. And crazy. they only represent about 15% of India's GDP. And what's been happening over the past um, several decades, really like originating with the English, of course, but like really taking ahead in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was an increasing corporatization of the farming industry um, away from these small farmers who are all across mm -hmm. the continent doing these things and more towards these sort of corpor corporations. Um, so it's a very standard thing, but it's really coalesced because. Fast forward to the day, and we'll get into more context. There are a um, there's a huge uprising. You had like 200 million or so um, people out in the streets in different parts of India, kind of uniting together, um, and this one big workers' protest to demand for better treatment of um, the farmers and a better like chance and uh, economic stability through different measures that are put through uh, by the government to protect farmers and make sure that they can sustain themselves and have a living while providing food for people. And of course, what happens when you have a bunch of workers getting together? The corporations do their thing in the background mm -hmm. and they do their best to suppress those protests by any means necessary, including um, working with the government to get the use of tear, can tear gas, um, water cannons. Uh, they were just like beating people with batons to try to quell workers in this uprising. Of course, that only made them more upset and more angry at the government who was like messing around and creating all these new policies and taking away these protections I was talking about that make it so farmers basically have no ability to make a living. And we'll get into some of the drastic details of this, but I think it's just amazing that there's so many parallels between what's happening um, all the way across the world, at least for us speaking in California, and a lot of what's happening in the United States, especially as a response um, to COVID-19 and the way farm workers and essential workers are being treated by these large corporations in bed with the government. I, I, I think it's actually really intriguing to what's happening in India too, because I always, it's, it's always, it's always kind of, you want to, it's, it's a good observation for any, anybody kind of watching in terms of like world politics and stuff, how countries with a billion plus manage their populations and how they manage their GDP. Obviously we know the kind of the successes of China and how they're, they're doing mm -hmm. India right there next to them, kind of on a different side of that. And I think that what what's, Looking at your map, checking if that's right. Okay, I think what's interesting about India, though, it's it's 
of India out of all the countries, like especially when it comes to billion population, not a lot of them, of course, but they would really benefit a lot from the people having more the farmers having more uh, economic stability, getting more money. I think that if there's one type of economy that would be be more successful with the people making more money, it would be a population of a billion plus. Now, of course, uh, corporations want to leech everything they can out of so many people. Like when you have that much, that many people, corporations are like literally like drooling and salivating at the prospect of being able to take advantage of that large population size. But it's great for them that 200 million plus hit the street and want to gonna unionize and protest against everything that's going on, especially the farmers, because it's great because if they're able to even get a five to ten percent increase on 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 money back and and, and salaries and healthcare and benefits for the people, that's going to do dramatic for just their economy in general. That that's more money they're able to put back into the economy, more money they're able to put back into their own farms, upgrading technology, things like that. It's so beneficial for them. But as we know on this show. Corporations are like, nah, homie, I don't care about that. I don't care if those if they're still if they're suffering. I don't care if the if how they're tilling is so old school. We want more on our end. So shout out to them for taking the, the approach to the people. And I would say that Americans kind of have been doing a little bit of that this year. There has been a lot of uprising. There has been a lot of unionization of the people against what they feel is improper practice by the government improper uh, the wages we've seen you we've seen union strikes for for a long time against walmart and people standing up employees so it's great to see what the great thing i heard about the india protests is not just farmers it's a lot of the people too families coming out and that's what you like to see a lot of times we see picket lines and we just see employees but it's great to see the communities coming together too. community response when it comes into multiple communities, the communities, the population grows and it's got the attention of the world. You know, I was even reading it and I was I, I it let me down a Wikipedia loophole of reading about the history of India and, you know, what happened with England, like you brought up and when 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 the, the colonization things are happening back then, too. So pretty great. Uh, it's 200, 250 million people. Yes, thank you. Protested, which is ridiculous. That's so many humans said "fuck you" because they are getting <laughs> Whoa. Vi- because they're getting screwed. It's, it's, they're really getting screwed by their corporations and their government. It's I mean, the largest yeah. worker the government of, movement in history, like it, of people yeah. gathering on the planet. Like, just think about that. For which a moment. is mental. I mean, bigger than the yeah. I, I mean, how many uprisings has there been in human history? This is the biggest one by far. Mm-hmm. Um. There's been a lot of problems with the Indian government um, over the past couple of decades. They, I mean, they have a lot of things with the religion stuff going on. They have their tensions with China and <clears throat> Kashmir land and everything else. But that's a whole different um, Pakistan. Pakistan and too. Yeah. There's a whole different uh, rabbit hole to go down under. But anyways, I know that they've been screwing their farmers for decades. Um, one of my friends who I play hockey with... Um, his family is, uh, is Indian, so he was actually telling me about this because the reason they moved here is because of that. When in the nineties, actually, I'm glad Dan put that in a note because I learned this from him. Uh, I learned this from Vivek, my friend. He was saying that in the nineties, when they all the GMOs were starting to come out, and it really screwed a lot of farmers. His family had to move because um, they were not getting enough money from it and stuff. And um, um, a lot of his family who were farmers, they moved to America because they just were basically almost broke and going into an obscene amount of debt because of all the GMOs and stuff that they started to put into their farms and the corporations are starting to do, to do factory farming and they're like, they don't have the resources and stuff available to keep up with them. And so I had to keep raising prices, people were buying their stuff and they had to go and they had to restart their lives. So it's just been, and that's been basically keeping continuing and going on and on and on. Um, and it's crazy to see um, that many people rise up. And it gives me a small hope that it is possible and whatnot yeah. to still have a general strike of that regard, to still have that mu- that many people have one thing in mind to help each other out, to go around. It's not them being very selfish. It's them saying, hey, this is, as a whole, the collective we, the royal we, are not getting enough to survive. And if you want this country to keep being afloat, if you want yourselves to even see your profits going, you need to do us a favor and you need to change out your policies and to help us as workers in this or else you're not going to have enough. And this whole thing too of people saying that if there aren't too many farmers, uh, that there are too many farmers in India, that's like their whole country was founded on farming. And also they literally do not have, like a lot of these workers and a lot of these people do not have the educational systems or they 
because it tends to be like the poorest, most illiterate people. They do not have the um, the resources available for them to get out of it. So that's basically the only thing they could do is farm. It, it, I heard that it's like it's getting so large, it's starting to seep into just all working class people there. So I heard it's like starting yeah. to talk. At the, one of the big discussion points is how how some of these corporations, America, have industries and and mm-hmm. plants out there and. And not just America, but, you know, Europe. And there's a lot of plants out there. And those workers are starting to, to join in, too. So it's becoming a mass. Uh, like, it's becoming just become, honestly, a tornado against the other side, which is great. It's great to see these people come together for this because – and I, I'm always, I'm, I'm kind of keeping my eye on it because I want to see how it's going to seep into some of the uh, other uh, East Asian countries and and what's going on with there. Because I know America and a lot of corporations, and including, you know, Apple and stuff, have stuff in China and stuff in yeah. other, uh, other Asian countries in terms of, like, plants and – industry and industrial so i want to see if that's gonna um the tension on that on that side of the world is gonna seep into the other parts because that's gonna have a massive impact you know one of the reasons we're over there is just due to how cheap labor is and how we're able to exploit labor there for for our mass demand of products um and i want to see how it's going to be affected you know let it you know hypothetically and of course just saying if it happens like let's say some massive wage demand that happens and they increase wages and everything who knows? That might transition to to work coming back and growing back in America because if you're having to pay more anyways, you might as well just work build more in America to have this stuff. So it's it's curious to see. It's curious to see who takes credit for it. I really hope that uh, uh, the people get what they're asking for because that's what it's about, right? You know, the people are making demands, and I hope they get what they want. And at least with we know how powerful corporations are. I hope it's always it's never what it's never getting. You never really get everything you want but if you get an increase if you get some type of change that's the big that's a big impact and that's what it matters what to I want, me. what i want to the, highlight really fast is the economic mechanism yeah. of um what is happening because that, that point in the 1990s mm-hmm. when genetically modified um food started getting into the market especially in um india what you had was these uh farmers who were using traditional seeds and means had to adopt these um mm-hmm. things they had to adopt these um new crops and new seeds in order to compete just on a basic level. And so they went into like all this crazy amount of debt, getting out all these loans, spending everything they had, using all the collateral they had in order to try to compete with um, the Monsanto UCs from these mega corporations who had all the deals with the government and had all the deals um, with like the, the, the global economic system that is um, often heralded as being something we can't touch on like a broader level, but like you can't question it on a broader level, but like we have to question what it actually does to people in these countries. And so as a result, whenever you didn't have like a, an unsuccessful crop and you're one of those farmers who had just taken out all these loans and you're just like in the middle of India somewhere and you're like, increasingly in debt and all of your livelihood is gone, well, you had this case where the number was ridiculous. Like, since the year 2000, 300,000 farmers in India have died by suicide because this is just, like, all too much for them to handle. I mean, like, that is, again, not to be morbid, but also to be accurate, about the number of people who have died from COVID-19. I don't know if we even care about numbers anymore, but at least, like, that's a factor right there. The amount of U.S. soldiers that died in the Second World War, I mean, that's a lot of freaking uh, humans. Like, uh, a 9-11 every day for 10,000 days like it, it's that's probably wrong because i'm not that great at math especially it doesn't well mathematics a thousand a thousand days. there we go a thousand it's one of those zeros right or 100 yes. days but like there's massive damage being done to people and to communities that is kind of just being shunned away by this global um multinational corporation power complex that is just push people to their limits and so yeah it's great that people are starting to rebel in that to some extent at least when they see their exact material conditions being farmers but there's always going to be that struggle of like oh well first they came for farmers but i didn't react because i'm not a farmer kind of measure where you have to kind of bring people together across um class and solidarity which if you want to talk about bringing Mm -hmm. people across class and solidarity in india that's another cultural boundary you're gonna like have to cross and go over but like you, you're going to have to get these people to unite and see themselves as different, diverse parts of a common problem and a common like goal of which to solve. Ba- Bam's been uncharacteristically quiet, so I wanted to get something of what he had to say before you go, Sean. <laughs> um, no, like there's they're, they're saying that there's been over um, 450 different 
unions and organizations that have supported this uh, general strike in India so far. Um, even talking about the class of solidarity, there's even doctors are going on strike. Wow. Um, so it's definitely. Yeah, so it's definitely not just farmers. There's a lot of different um, unions that have been involved. Like, basically every union that's not aligned with the government is, like, down for the strike or is participating. Nice. Um, and, yeah, it's unprecedented in a lot of ways because, yeah, that – I mean, obviously India has over a billion people, but <clears> – <throat> 250 million, that's like three quarters of the United States. Like, that's like an insane number. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, like, maybe for us, like, we're sort of metropolitan, don't really get, like, the power of the agricultural industry and how often farmers actually go on strike throughout the world. I remember, I, I want to say this was last year or the year before last, like, in France, the a bunch of farm. I think I, I want to say it was tomato farmers. They were like upset at the price that they were getting given for their tomatoes. And they just like rolled up with um, like bulldozers full of their tomatoes and just dumped them all into the road. Um, and I, I, th- I think this is in Italy. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is in Italy. Like there was a big milk, uh, like the dairy farmer yeah. protest and they were like just dumping the milk out because of the prices they were being, uh, being given for their product. Um, you know, farmers, like it's it's agriculture. Obviously, is probably the biggest industry in the world still. And you know, when they get together, they can they can they make big demands when they when they get together like that. Obviously, Mans- Monsanto is probably the most evil uh, corporation <laughs> in the world, a bear Monsanto, uh, whatever it is now. But um, yeah, I mean, it, when I was reading about it, it kind of reminded me also because we also mentioned how the Indian. Um, the strikes in India didn't really get too much coverage. Um, I remember the teacher strikes that were happening here last year and in 2018, mm-hmm. they were huge. And you know, I mean, not to say they didn't get coverage, because obviously I was reading about it and it, they did get coverage, but it's like... Not the proportional coverage you know, that you would have suspected a monumental moment like that, a ma- amount of like solidarity and unison around a political issue compared to, you know, whatever, like, fake form policy, like, drama that um trump was getting himself into at that particular time like this is about disproportionate yeah. media coverage yeah for sure like and and you know and obviously like people who know about american history like domestically like there's been massacres in regards to uh strikes and like labor oh, yeah. activity like it's probably you know if you read about like labor in this country, like you'll you'll hate America. <laughs> like they've been like massacres against striking people um, in this country, and it's probably the biggest fight that there's been f- from jump is like the fight of the elite class against labor, and do to do everything to divide people along those lines. Um, to make sure there's like zero class solidarity and just keep people divided so they don't end up doing these um, labor actions. So it's 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 really great to see that going on in India. It was so many people. Obviously, they couldn't come out, and I, I do think there was there was some violence, but it was like so many people that they couldn't just go out and start shooting everybody. Um, which I'm sure that Modi you would not to. be opposed Modi to. Would very much <laughs> not be opposed to. Yeah, um, and 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 I want to say there was some violence in the beginning, but it it got so big that there couldn't be any kind of like mass like massive violent response. Um, so yeah, like Caesar was saying, hopefully we can, hopefully we can see these actions seeping into other countries, maybe Vietnam, uh, mm-hmm. Thailand, uh, M- Malaysia, where they have a lot of these like sweatshop ass factories. Um, you know, labor around the world can stand up or whatever other communist. Um, tagline i can think of um the humble proletarian almost nothing but his chains um, Ooh. The, the other thing is that the media does not want to cover this as much as they can because it'll give hope into the workers and the last thing that the god forbid the head the the upper class wants is a worker uprising because that's how you get rid of them and yes they don't want that because they want their money also i swear to god buyer uh, um, when Bayer bought out uh, Monsanto, they did it so that way they could sell you a pill after they poison you with all the GMOs that are in their foods. At, thanks, at, thanks at Bill Gates on all this, at Bill Gates on all this, a big investor in Monsanto. Thanks, 
Mm. Thanks, we call Germany. that vertical integration. Yeah. That's yeah. vertical integration, folks. That's a business tactic, and uh, it's a hell of a job. Um, <laughs> no, no, that, that 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 pretty much does it. Like we we have so much more that unites us than divides us, especially when it comes to the material struggles that we face every single day, whether it is um, in India, in the United States, in whatever space shuttle like um, SpaceX test rocket from Mars that Caesar happens to oh, be in. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm at I'm at an official military facility right now. We're so building a robot, so just please watch your mouth because we will find you. nine or what? Uh, can I can, can, can I say something else about India too? Um, <clears throat> like probably people sitting in the United States wouldn't understand how diverse India Hell is. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Ethnically, religiously, um, and and the rich history of some place like India, like. You, those things are generally impediments to massive, like uh, political or labor action. But it, it's it's definitely like something to be celebrated that they were able. A lot of people were able to put those differences aside and come out for like labor rights. There's a lot of differences between Indians too. Like, there's a lot of racism between classes and stuff in India as well. Wow, you there's gotta bring bring up stuff, the bad so. part. Wow, wow. But no, I'm saying that there's a lot of stuff that people don't talk about within it. But it's really cool to see a lot of people standing together, and, and despite all of that, to go uh, into one. But like to, to that point, I just say that like it's the same things that because at least I'll speak from being in a lot of different cultures personally. That like every culture has like within their own culture different like sort of classes they have that are implicit or explicit based on how no, they yeah, view sure. other people within that class of course it just always gets to a new level once <laughs> you have two billion people on earth or two billion people like in your country like it's always going to um hit this new sort of um maximum point if you will because there's just more people kind of that you're working with and so yeah the people just do not sleep on india <laughs> Yeah, and I, I'll make a quick point. Um, I, I know it's okay to go off topic real quick. I know it's I mean, a flat. I mean, flat we're, we're, we're near no? the end. Okay. I mean, if if you if you want to continue changing Zoom backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's real quick. Um, uh, I was seeing some articles and stuff this week. They were talking about how, oh, like you know, the 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 counterpoint to the COVID stuff we talked earlier about relief is like, well, you know, some countries were just providing relief, and look what happened to their debt. An example was used in Brazil. Uh, me and Bam come in live from the same place. Uh, he's on the other side of the department. Um, it, it's funny that their counterpoint is like, well, look, Brazil did a economic stimulus plan in September monthly for $55 American dollars a month, 300 reals. And look at the turnout. I think that's one of the stupidest points I ever heard in my entire life. When the country, literally during this pandemic... We have we have unemployment here, right? There's unemployment in America that's supreme levels, like it's ridiculous. But we don't have an eighty percent extreme pop extreme poverty population. So when you have an eighty percent extreme pop poverty population and you're giving them three hundred reels a month, how do you expect a massive growth in economic? People are just trying to buy use that money to just survive another month. You know, like, so I think it's really corny when they're using, for example, we talked about Sweden as an example, whatever, when it's, when, or whatever, or when they're using these other, your small European countries as a, as a positive point for them on why they can't use, uh, hey, you hear me over here? I'm talking to you across, across the way. I think it's really whack when they're doing that When The tension needs to be ha getting relief aid to the people now, especially before the end of the year. You know, it's sad that a lot of people value how important holidays are here, but a lot of people don't have money to spend the holidays for their families, especially the, whether you're celebrating Hanukkah, whether you're celebrating Christmas or whatever, or the Kwanzaa, you're doing your thing. Um, it's sad that we're going to not probably not have an answer by Christmas. They might extend until then because senators want to take weeks off from, from doing work. And I hope that some change comes soon because people re reserve the relief aid before the end of the year. And, you know, that's what they voted for and I hope they get that soon. What the hell is this dude uh, going backwards on the episode for? D D Dan, are you going to clip that and put it back when we were talking about that? I, I, I love how <coughs> Bam just loves to like live edit during the show and like react quickly to whatever's going on on the screen. Also, I'm <laughs> yeah, but he will he will he will live edit his own face onto the screen. He still has his mouth off screen, but go ahead though, go off. <laughs> we still get forehead cam all day of Bam. Pause, but you know I'm gonna come over there and fix his camera. He's right there. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Giuliani. Sean, also, chill. I, 
Sean, Sean's sabotaging on purpose. I'm so down. <laughs> the hell is he down? For the record, <laughs> I'm trying to do something. Hey, the, 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 I, I love. I, I'm gonna cut out all of this, dude. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that one. No, no. Hang up my but, call. But, 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 the blooper but, reel. But, no, 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 real talk though. Um, I misstated a lot that India's population is like two billion. It's more like one point four billion, but it's a lot of people. Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, yeah. I tried I to correct say it by saying a billion, but. Nah, two billion. It's Let's okay. go. It's okay. Sean was they saying don't do sen- they don't do a proper census out there. They don't. Okay. Do I just say Egypt instead of Libya because I got. Sean, Sean said so. Egypt two, two or three times. So I was, I was he like, well, he like, said Gaddafi like, in Egypt. I was like, I'm nice. Like, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I don't know if Egypt is Libya. He was like, ass. they all look the same. Look, Whatever. Look, all the the same whole dictator. point is, it's all the same dictator. It's all sand we, to me, anyway. So hey, man. Hey. They all got pyramids. The whole point is that we have a lot of. You know, this is one of those things where we call um, opportunities for learning, <laughs> and um, we, 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 we can gr- we can grow that here. That sounds like. A, and um, I'm gonna try to end the show because your, we've been. Your so let's just let's try to. Opportunities for learning. Well, I hope that you take all that out. <laughs> uh, it's, Please. You know, you know, uh, we'll see how it happens. We'll see how. No, he's gonna say he's gonna take it out. Then it's gonna be dropped as a Twitter clip of me looking stupid. I'm so down. <laughs> I mean, you gave me so Let's much to choose that. from, Caesar. It might just happen. But anyways, Ooh. thank you very much all for joining me. Um, <laughs> I-, I love you, Caesar. Joining I'm, I'm you? I'm happy to know right. that this, it's, you're great. Appreciate you, man. Um, oh, my God, the background changes. <laughs> see, that's the annoying thing, too, is the backgrounds. I'm going to try to end this. Thank you all for joining um, this variety show where we have way too much technology to play with as we try to stumble our way through um, political topics that aren't being talked about in the mainstream media, but uh, we think are important and um, are very important, as we've just proven over the past several bit in time. Um, the folks with the acid rain backgrounds uh, are do We Made It podcast. It can be found at wemadeitpodcast.com. We Made It podcast on social media platforms. Uh, Bam, what, where can people find you otherwise? And also, what else do you got going on? Look, go on freediscussionsociety.com. Um, we will be having the next topic oh, right. on the 17th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. It will be how has the concept how has the concept of whiteness in America affected your life? And I know Sean has a lot to say about that. <laughs> Anyways, um, um, okay. Caesar. Uh, you can find me um, on uh, YouTube. I stream... Uh, weekly, three times a week now. A court coming up. We we made it seas. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, of course. Brazil seas, and just we made it seas on everything else. Um, I'm very a variety streamer. I got reactions on there. Um, nothing really political, but if it's a wild political video, I'll definitely react to it, send it to us. And of course, if you're trying to align with me, we made a podcast with me and Bam do together and, and free discussion society is coming up on Thursday. If you feel, you know, something about what we're saying or what's going on, uh, the great thing about free discussion society, it's not about necessarily where you stand. It's about speaking, speaking to everybody and letting you know, you have a voice where you can speak on it and you get to hear how other people see the world as well too. So. Free Discuss Society has been amazing for that, and I'm glad we have it back on Zoom. I, I can, except for last time when those those weirdos came through and tried to invade. Okay, I can absolutely <laughs> second that, and I can, we can also agree that we need to talk to Bam about how to set up Zoom calls so you actually have these things work the way you want them to, because that will yeah. definitely help. Um, because your homie needs an RSVP link, but this is not the area of that. Free Discussion Society is an amazing thing um, and a great space for people to talk about politics, <laughs> and it is really great. And I do love that, um, especially during the Zoom sessions that a lot of people, um, are, since they're locked down at homes, they can join in. And it's a really cool space to open it up to a lot of different people. So check that out, freediscussionsociety.com. Um, I guess there's just that other thing where Sean and I do a podcast called Audio Face, and this is the time of year where we do the Audio Face Awards. So um, make sure you are prepared for that. I know Sean is like listening to like three albums simultaneously almost every waking minute of the day preparing for this thing, right? We can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so um, we will be very um, much getting ready for that. And um, I've also got some other announcements. Make sure you check out Audio Face for that because that will be there. And follow me on social media at Dan from the Web on Twitter, at Dan from the Internet on Instagram, at Dan from the Web on Twitch, and Dan from the Internet on YouTube because I just like doing patterns and stuff like that. Anyways, um, thank you very much. Love for you, Dan. Us on Power Report. Love, love you, Dan. If you guys talk bad about Kid Cudi, I'm writing. <laughs>